Good morning, everybody. Today is the 24th of November, 2022. I feel like with these podcasts, you have to say the date because so much changes. Um, <laughs> we are interviewing today on the Stark Struck podcast, the Canvas team. We've got Tim and Dave here from Canvas. Um, and just as a disclosure, obviously they're building on Stark X, um, but we are focusing on this podcast to really get you to, to learn about the team and the product. Um, and yeah, so we will, uh, be interviewing you both. Uh, do you want to just start with a bit of introduction about who you are, uh, what you're up to? Sure. Dave, maybe first. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, I'm David. I'm CEO and co-founder at Canvas. Uh, so we've been working closely with the Starkware team to build layer two infrastructure for the future of finance. And prior to Canvas, my brother and I started a payment gateway company in way back in 2000, early days of the internet, uh, that we grew from a single desk in our grandmother's garage to being a global fintech serving uh, banks all around the world. I moved to Sp Singapore, spent some time in Singapore growing the business throughout Asia, Europe and the US. And in 2013, uh, we sold that business to NASDAQ listed Euronet. So that was a really amazing journey in Web2 and in the early days of the internet, seeing what e-commerce changed uh, our lives, and we believe the same thing is going to happen in the Web3 space with everything that's happening around blockchains and Layer 2, but it's still very, very early days. And joining on the line is uh, is Tim. Thanks, David. Thanks, Lauren, for having me as well. So, hi, I'm Tim Medell. I'm Head of Product and Co-Founder at Canvas. So, prior to joining David and the team at Canvas, I was a management consultant for 20 years with various large multinational organizations um, doing technology and strategy consulting. And so in those roles, you know, I saw a huge amount of, um, you know, oversaw and ran digital transformations in financial services and other industries and, you know, was helping to, I guess, weed out the inefficiencies of, of systems and platforms uh, as part of these uh, large transformation projects and had a huge passion for, for trying to make things better faster and cheaper in, in the way that uh, big and small organizations can operate. And so that was uh, where I uh, sort of, I guess, got the uh, the love for having a, a single record or system of truth. And that's uh, what then got me excited to uh, look in blockchains and, uh, and see how that can help solve a lot of uh, problems with uh, data and uh, integration. And so back about two years ago, I uh, had known David since uh, some childhood days and uh, joined together with him to uh, build some amazing things at Canvas. Fantastic. So most of the founders we interview are uh, a bit younger than you guys. Uh, they are there um, in the 20s, just out of university or out of high school. So I want to actually go back to 20 years ago for both of you guys. Um, can you describe like what it, what what's what it's like uh, maybe David to start a um an internet company in two thousand I don't know where that was in terms of the um the tech bubble before or after you obviously went through the tech bubble at any rate um, how was it like talking to investors at that time did they know what the internet was can you like just bring us back to your life twenty years ago sure so. I, uh, I worked closely with my brother. My brother is 10 years older than me and he started the business and I joined straight out of school, uh, out of high school. Um, and it was very, very different to how it is now. Now, there was, think about a, a world where there's no AWS, where there's no GCP, where there's no Azure, and you actually have to spend a lot of money in order to buy physical equipment to put in a physical data center that you have to maintain and plug all the cables and make sure that it stays up and running. So we got funded. We actually had our seed round was in October of 2000. So that was the depths of the dot-com bubble crash. And really it was a pretty dark place because a lot of companies had raised a lot of money on no uh, sustainable business models. And really that gone out of business. So our addressable market had shrunk significantly. It's not, uh, it was a very, very different place from the perspective of setting up a business and what you needed to spend any capital that you raised on. We spent a lot of the money that we raised on just on physical equipment to actually uh, 
be able to run the platform and the business. And so if you contrast that today, the barriers to entry are a lot lower because you can just write code, spin up AWS, AWS will give you a fortune in free credits. It really comes down to the ability of having a really good idea and also more importantly, being able to execute really well. So I think it's, it's, it's changed. I wouldn't say it's easier or harder. It's just, it evolves over time, but it was definitely, I can say without a doubt, like I flew around the world putting out fires at data centers virtual, you know, and dealing with outages and dealing with all different kinds of things in to, so that we could have high availability, high uptime, uh, data centers running on a global basis with low latency because we were working with banks around the world. And now in 10 seconds and a few lines of code, you can have the same thing on AWS that we would have spent millions of dollars to develop. So it's a different place to what it is now. It's actually wild to think about that because I've never thought about that. Yeah, any startup, whatever you're doing, I mean, you were, you were in payments even and you still have to have like some big DevOps team dealing with uh, literally where do these cables go in this machine? Why is this machine turning off? Um, wow, that is uh, completely mind blowing. And then, in terms of um, maybe jumping a few years for both of you, I think um, you also went through the the um, global financial crisis, and maybe that was more of a, a financial crisis than a um, an engineering crisis. But like, what was the world like back then? I was still in high school. Most of our listeners were probably in high school or younger. I'll take this one. I think it was quite interesting. I've actually got a, a funny personal story around or a professional context for around this that led me towards blockchain, um, you know, in later years, which was actually at the time and literally around um, the, the time that Lehman Brothers collapsed, I was actually working for a large management consulting firm did, doing a digital transformation on a subprime mortgage management system. And when we first went in there, I was absolutely shocked about the lack of controls and the simplicity of how these actual, you know, subprime mortgages were being classified, managed, and then, you know, serviced on a, a monthly basis to the point that, you know, it would have been very simple for somebody to go in there and make a couple of changes with very few controls, no, you know, immutability on, on transactional data or the actual balances, et cetera, which then, you know, when all these different organisations sort of fell over, it was certainly no surprise given the insight that I'd had at the time about how these sort of um, very complex products were being managed or, or, you know, not managed with a sufficient level of rigour to um to really protect the ultimate investors who were were buying these products and so um you know rolling forward a few years uh later and, and seeing you know bitcoin and ethereum and the potential of what this technology could achieve to provide you know sort of a distributed database effectively that uh, allows you to and everyone to have a, a single source of truth was something that was you know very powerful when I first sort of looked into it and I reflect back now and um, it definitely was one of the re real reasons that it, it forced me to drive down that rabbit hole of uh, of blockchain and uh, and where I am today but yeah it almost uh, reminds us of exactly what went on with FTX two weeks ago just poor operational yeah. control so it's, um, I definitely. guess that leads me a bit to a meta question um, like do you think this is just a like human psychology, these boom and bust cycles? We just have these cycles of greed. We do take shortcuts. We over there extend ourselves. Like, I'm just thinking, you know, 2000, 2001 tech, 2008 global financial crisis. We're going through what we're going now with the almost inevitable recession. Um, what What is it? Is it, is it like it's human psychology? Is it the, um, is it the Fed? You know, what, what, what do you, what do you guys think? Like, how, did, how does the world look like? Is this like, just like, coded into mankind I think there's a couple there's a couple of dimensions and there's a couple of factors that are at play at the same time you've got if you if you look back at 2000 uh, and the dot com bubble it's really the technology cycle it's a young technology the internet was super young and super basic when it first came out like there was what could you do in the early days of the internet you could do email and then you had 
intranets, you had AOL, you had closed loop systems, and it really grew over time to be what it is today. But that, the fact of where we've got mobile devices with high speed internet, like that's been a 20 year plus evolution. So really what you see at that time, everyone gets really excited about the potential, but the actuals and actually having a business that is a sustainable business model that generates revenue and can fund itself organically, as opposed to having to go out to the market to constantly raise capital. So there's that that's a big part of it. And yeah. I think that's what we're seeing now with Web3 as well. And we're seeing just in the blockchain space, there has to be a sustainable business model in order for growth to actually happen once the froth and the excitement goes away. That's that's the technology cycle side. The other side is the macro side and what's happening with the world and what was the response to COVID and how governments enacted financial policy in order to stop us all uh, running into situations like the Great Depression. So there's a lot of things that have come together at the same time, and I really focus on technology, and I, I, I'm a geek, and I love technology. And I think where we are in the blockchain technology cycle, it's just it's it's as excited as we all are on this call and probably watching. We think it's, you know, we've come a long way, but it's still very, like everyone says it, it's very, very early. So if you think about using blockchain and digital assets to rewrite finance and rewrite other areas of society, that is just like the internet. That's a 20-year journey, and we're only five, six, seven years into it. So it's still very, very early. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I think also for technology, you just there's endless potential. Every, like the marginal use case costs nothing once you've got the infrastructure set up. So you can get these booms and busts. Um, okay, I want to transition, and this will transition more to what you're doing today. But you've both you both have decades of history of working with organizations, with institutions, uh, with retailers, with small businesses to take on digital transformations. Um, and obviously, there there's, there's a lot of hesitance on their part. Either like, oh, why, why do we need the, you know, um, everything works as great as it is now. Um, can you like just describe any learnings you've had from the past few decades of doing that? Like, what do you, what do you think are like the biggest challenges with getting existing entities to move over to a new digital platform that improves their, um, their lives so much better? However long you think it's going to take, times it by seven to ten. And that will be the actual duration that it's going to take. It's dealing with, it's it's a very, very different proposition to go to an established enterprise or organization and say, we want to change something. And it, there can be all the improvements that you want, but you have to respect that the people that are making that decision are, they have a personal stake and they have like real skin in the game that if it succeeds, uh, you know, maybe they'll get some praise, but if it fails, it's a serious, serious issue. And so it's a big challenge and you have to be very respectful of the organization of the both of the people and the organization. And so it's really, it's it, you, if you come into it with a mindset of saying it's going to happen tomorrow, and it, even though I've got great technology, how could, it's obvious this should just be done straight away. You're going to be bitterly disappointed. And so it's really about having patience and being able to have the staying power in the space to actually get to that end goal. Um, and then, Tim, yeah, you go, please. I'd, I'd add to that, I think, number one to, to what Dave said, stakeholder management. Any large digital transformation when you're moving from, you know, zero to one, it, it, it's going to take time and patience and making sure that you align all the, the major stakeholders involved to, to ensure that everyone is on board and deal with the change management aspect is, is a much greater challenge than the technology challenge in, in every case, whether it be core finance systems, customer relationship systems, or, you know, blockchain now. Um, so I think that, that's a key point. But then the other part is to look at, you know, starting the, the journey with, a couple of small victories and trying rather than doing a big bang implementation, how can you break it down into smaller, um, you know, proof of concepts to then 
get the buy-in to then show what the the ultimate change can be rather than trying to to you know devour the entire project in uh, in one go and potentially have it either succeed or fail yeah makes sense there are a lot of, often a lot of layers here like each individual employee has their like end of year bonus that they're reaching out for and they don't want to break systems but then uh, you might have um, some smaller groups inside the company that are happy to take big bets Definitely, um, I see that. Um, and I think sometimes people don't really under, understand the problem. So I want, to, I want to transition to crypto now. You know, how did you both discover crypto? You mentioned you, you, um, Canvas was born roughly two years ago. How did you discover crypto? What did you initially think? Um, what problems did you think it was solving when you discovered it? And uh, yeah. Um, so I'll go. Uh, I, I saw Bitcoin in 2013. And at that time, uh, my brother and I were running a payment gateway. And I looked at it and I said to my brother, this is has the potential to replace Visa and MasterCard as a payments mechanism. You have never before had a network where you could send a payment, you could send value from one person to another with no intermediary decent speed and at low cost. It was just, it was so profound. It was it was like a real aha moment. And I, I really thought that, and I still do, that not, not, not necessarily Bitcoin as a payment mechanism, but as an underlying technology, it's, it was, seemed very clear to me the potential of blockchain technology to really disrupt finance and many other areas. But I, I did appreciate, I thought, well, wow, it's going to be a long road, but here you've got a, a genesis, you've got a spark, you've got a really, it's like when you when you first downloaded a song or when you first used streaming and you got instant gratification, you just thought, wow, this is going to be massive. The first time I saw BTC, that's that's how I felt. So before I go to Tim, did you, were you thinking back then about stable coins, uh, KYC, or it was just like, that will come later? Oh, uh, no, I didn't. I, I, yeah. I think about what it looked like back then. It was just Silk Road. It was, and that, that was like, that was everyone's, that was the only context that Bitcoin was being discussed in. And that, like, you, if you're in the space, I was in the payment space and I thought, okay, you can extract that and you, you can separate those two because cash is used for bad things as well. But really, right. me looking at as a geek, as a tech tech guy, I thought, wow, that's that's the new and shiny thing. I want to play with that. I want to spend a lot of time playing with that. And you, Tim? Yeah, similar. I, I you know sort of first heard about Bitcoin, I guess, for its more nefarious reasons rather than uh, anything else, you know, with Silk Road and the like. But then really started to dig into the technology probably a year or two after David. Um, but fell down that rabbit hole quite quickly and just seeing the power of having decentralized you know, gold, money, whatever you wanted to call it, payment mechanism. And then Ethereum came along and kind of took me a little bit of a while to get my head around it and uh, had a friend who was building something in the space and that turned out to be one of the early DeFi apps that, um, you know, when I saw that happen then and, and sort of how smart, contracts was going to revolutionize finance and you know the way we we interact and transact on a global basis that was the absolutely mind-blowing moment for me to see that you could you know mint a, a stable coin and have it you know collateralized and backed and and you know this entire ecosystem that could develop um off the back of of what ethereum built and you know that was when i knew that that this was going to have to be part of my future in some way shape or form all right, great. So let's just transition into Canvas, what you're trying to do there based on these blockchain building blocks. Um, <clears throat> yes, yeah, so like uh, you mentioned DeFi on Ethereum. Um, wh what is can where does Canvas come into the picture there? What are the products? What's the vision? What are you trying to build? Sure. So we fundamentally believe that over time, all assets will be tokenized, all value will be tokenized. And billions of users that are not in blockchain today will be accessing uh, DeFi powered products under the hood, or they'll be using financial products and services that are 
powered by DeFi and they might not even know it. And so what's really necessary in order to kickstart that next wave of adoption? Where are those billions of users? They're in traditional finance. They're in Web2 companies. They're in fintech companies. And what's important for them is they need infrastructure. They need really simple APIs and SDKs in order to allow them to roll out these services to their customers. And as you move into more regulated environments, and I think regulation we have to accept is going to come in this post-FTX world, there's important things to happen around the space of compliance and confidentiality that are going to be needed in order for certain use cases. And so our goal is to build that compliant confidentiality layer for Ethereum and the infrastructure that's needed in order to service the needs of these companies that are bringing their users into the space. Let me just uh, double uh, click on one thing you said. You said all assets will be tokenized and you're very confident that happening in the future. Why? Let's say I'm a guy in my 60s, I live in my house, you're telling me my, my real estate's being tokenized. Next time I sell it, I'm like sending an NFT to the buyer. Why? Well, it's, it's, it's more efficient. So if you think about uh, the way that assets trade today and what are what is necessary in order to, say, settle a trade and what's necessary to move funds from one counterparty to another. There's a lot of disparate systems that are involved and there's uh, there's middlemen and intermediaries that have been in, put in place specifically to ensure that trades settle just because two parties can't trust each other. And that creates a lot of friction, delays and cost that can be stripped out with tokenization. So make no mistake, this is a long, long journey, but it's going to happen. The numbers that you hear that are coming out of BCG and HSBC and other studies, they're saying that it's 27 trillion, you know, huge numbers, trillions of dollars over the next 10 years will move to blockchain-based structures because it's better, faster and cheaper and more efficient to run uh, to run platforms that are using uh, blockchain underneath the hood as opposed to traditional systems. But it's a very long journey. But what it means is that it's going to get cheaper to run and it's also going to create new opportunities to do different things that you otherwise weren't able to do before. Things that all three of us and people that are watching, you're using DeFi and you consider using Aave and putting something into putting an asset into Aave and taking out a loan instantly, uh, you take it for granted, but none of that is available in traditional finance. And I think what you'll see and what's made possible through tokenization is that next leg that you can start uh, doing new things that were not otherwise possible. So like maybe from your pure commerce days, can you just describe the friction in the existing system? Like if I'm sending, I, I don't know exactly know what you were doing back then, but it's like, an international bank transfer from Australia to America takes a few days, right? And I think it's it's, it's not just like a anti-money laundering checks and uh, KYC checks. There's actual like friction in the, in the technology, like, the, and that the blockchain can come and solve that, right? Yeah, absolutely. To send money internationally is has to be done via SWIFT, which is a is a thirty year old system, and it's really uh, not designed for high speed payments and it really comes from a place where there wasn't really an alternative and now what if, if you think about when you swipe your credit card or when you tap your visa or you tap your apple pay or your google pay you know you get an instant approval and you can leave the supermarket with your shopping but what happens behind the scenes there's so many steps of going from the credit card machine to the bank that's provided the credit card facilities, going to Visa and MasterCard, Visa and MasterCard, uh, getting it to the counterparty bank and getting the approval. And then that's just for the messaging. And then at the end of day, actually moving funds, there's so many steps along the way that introduce, that, that slow down the process and introduce risk. There's a huge issue with international payments just getting to the wrong place and getting rejected or being lost and 
none of that exists in blockchain. You can send directly, I can send you an asset, I can send you stable coin or whatever value it may be instant. And it's at a, an extremely low cost. And so that's really where in the, in the payment space in particular, you haven't really seen blockchain take off as such. It's still very early in terms of like person to person payments, but it's going to happen. It might not, you, it, it, it will evolve in different ways. Uh, but if you think about what is the what is the potential for uh, for sending payments from one person to another with instant speed and at very low cost, uh, that's an extremely powerful and exciting primitive. If you think about what are the what are the alternatives today? You've got Visa and Mastercard, you've got Swift, or even you have fintechs that allow you to move money internationally. Um, at, at high speed, but they have to have a huge amount of capital tied up all around the world in order for, to facilitate that. Okay, I want to um, just make sure, I assume some of the listeners for this part of the podcast might be less familiar with blockchain and, uh, and this whole world. So I want to maybe play a bit of devil's advocate and, uh, and see what your responses are. So some people will say, we, we, we need to live in a regulated world. We need to make sure that the tax office knows what I'm doing with my money so I can pay the right taxes, that um, I'm not sending money to sanctioned entities. Um, and apparently blockchains are open, permissionless and public, and that can never be prevented. How do you respond to that? I think if you, if you consider the way that the traditional finance works right now, there is a huge amount of control and there's laws around monitoring for uh, for bad things that happen with money and rightfully so anti-money laundering uh, counterterrorism funding uh, drugs like really bad stuff that rightfully so there should be uh, monitoring and transactions monitoring of transactions to stop and so when you when you have a blockchain based structure it really creates uh, an, a ledger that allows for a a view of payments that are happening in a system. I, I I don't think that necessarily changes the profile of the movement of money because the 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 transaction monitoring that's already that is in place already exists today. When you're sending money from your bank account, it's just a matter of how long it takes uh, to be monitored. So this is a really um, this is a really dynamic space, and there's a lot of opinions. Of course, I'm probably amongst these listeners. There'd be a huge range of uh, of opinions and how they'd want to what they consider to be what should be private, what should be public. I think what you'll see and evolve uh, over time is compliant confidentiality that evolves on top of public networks. So you still have the benefit of using a public permissionless network, but then there are uh, there is the ability to have still confidentiality of your transactions or privacy of your transactions, but still fulfilling uh, the, the uh, requirements to have oversight by authorized parties of, you know, which could be government, could be regulators. And whether you, uh, you know, whether you agree with that they should be seeing transactions is is it's a personal it's a personal opinion or it's it, it's for one to decide. But really, the way that uh, the way that we view that blockchain will evolve is having still having a public ledger, still having some transactions that can be open, but there will be an ability to have some level of confidentiality and privacy, which you'd expect with using like as you do with your bank account. If I send you money, you can't see everything that I've ever done on my bank account, but still having that level of uh, of oversight that is necessary to comply with global laws. Okay, so I want to, I want to, Tim, go. I'd add to that as well. Like, uh, you know, you, you mentioned that people say nefarious activity, you know, it, it's facilitating nefarious activity and, and all these other horrible things. I, I think I'd flip it around and say that, you know, it is one of the most, sort of easily traceable and, and, you know, clearly transparent um, technologies to actually 
facilitate transfer of, of let's say, assets or um, or payments or, or stable coins, whatever is the case, between two parties. And yes, there's going to be areas of, of you know, regulation and and um, confidentiality um, that that get built into these protocols. But I think that it's removing a lot of the um, black economy rather than facilitating the the black economy. It, it's really helping try and solve um, what has existed within cash based economies for a long time. And and the the more that we move to this, the the more easy it's going to be for. Uh, for us as society to eradicate some of these really horrible things out of our uh, out of our lives. Um, yeah, I think back to the um, FTX. Firstly, when they paused withdrawals, within an hour, Twitter was saying, "Hey, look, the FTX wallets are no longer sending any money to users." You would never have that in the traditional world. So there's a transparency that you don't have in the traditional system. And then there was that rogue employee, it looks like, who on the Saturday night stole a few hundred million dollars of funds. And in real time, everybody's monitoring, hey, he just sent some funds from Kraken. We can KYC him. Hey, he's dumping his Ethereum. He's selling his Bitcoin. And you just don't get that transparency in the traditional world. Um, you you mentioned this um, idea of still having a confidentiality layer. So... Um, you have this layer two on top of the base layer where people can transact. Those individual transactions are not exposed to the Ethereum uh, blockchain. I want you to just maybe spend a few minutes explaining this uh, and trying to uh, maybe imagine that I'm some non-blockchain native uh, listener. Uh, can I understand this, what's going on? Sure. Uh, Tim, do you want to go or shall I? I'm happy for you to to go, and I can add add round the edges at the end. Yeah. Okay. So if you if I send you a bank transfer now, you, it sounds ludicrous for me to say that you can see everything that I've ever done on my bank account, everything that I've bought since the history of me opening that bank account, and that's exactly how it is on blockchain today, and that. The, the beauty of having an open ledger is actually, it's a double-edged sword. So if you're sending from one wallet to another, you can see the complete transaction history and from that point before and from that point onwards. So what we think about is from a, from a payments perspective, that doesn't really work. And so when we think about having some level of confidentiality, we can use what the uh, what the blockchain was intended for, which is to secure, to provide a very secure layer uh, in order to have your assets. But then, when we start moving into layer two, we can move transactions to do some transactions in an environment where it's off chain and it's essentially in a in a compliant, confidential away from layer one, but we're still holding those transactions, those history in order to satisfy um, what would be necessary in terms of disclosure. So really thinking about having the, all the benefits of having a public decentralized open ledger, but having an ability to do some transactions with confidentiality. I think likening it, David, to what SSL did for e-commerce mm. in the fact that, you know, until the the open, you know, sort of um, when SSL was was allowed to be embedded in browsers and, and could be used by everyone, I think, you know, the, the challenge with e-commerce was it was all running in the clear and all the, the security concerns and, and risks associated with that. And when that you know, amazing technology came along. Finally, people could confidently put their credit card online and and know that they weren't going to you know end up with fraudulent transactions or other other sort of risks of, of being able to interact online. And so, I really see that solving this confidentiality piece in a compliant way is really really important to to help move the space forward and and find that sort of correct medium between allowing the regulators to be able to see and, and oversee to ensure that there isn't any kind of um, 
nefarious activity or, or wrongdoing happening, but at the same time give the, the users the privacy that they um, want to be able to transact on these public systems. Yeah, it's really interesting. If you think about what kicked off the e-commerce boom, it was the introduction of SSL. And when SSL came in, it was actually categorized in the same as like as uh, biological weapons by the US. And so it was a journey to actually get approval to have SSL as part of the browser. But that conf- that encryption layer that got made available really was allowed uh, what, what kicked off uh, the e-commerce boom. That was the key enabler to what we what we take for granted today, where you can swipe on your phone and order anything. And so coming back to what we were talking about before, it's really early and it's a very, very complicated issue to satisfy for a lot of different perspectives. And it's not going to satisfy it's not going to satisfy everyone. Uh, but what's clear is that if you have these capabilities in place, we believe that over time it will allow much more usage and allow us to grow uh, the space and bring in much more adoption than what's in uh, in the space right now. Makes total sense. I think when uh, Andres, when uh, Mark Andreessen uh, created SSL or productized it, the NSA called him over. Um, There's some big outburst there. But yeah, you would not have be able to have credit card payments today without that. Um, okay, so so. Following up on what you were saying, like, what does Canvas look like in ten years? Assuming, uh, you know, re- re- your regulators are friendly towards this whole space, um, what what's the vision? Are people like literally using Canvas as their bank? Um, what 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 products are they doing on on this platform? What are they not doing on this platform? Where do you think things are heading? Uh, I think we the way that. Our vision is that we're essentially providing the network and the backbone and the infrastructure that's connecting a lot of different participants uh, on this shared ledger and bringing them into being able to transact with with each other on Ethereum, on on a public blockchain like Ethereum, but with having confidentiality, low cost transactions and high speed and certainty uh, that is provided, can only be provided when you're working in a layer two on a public network. And so what's our vision? That there's billions of users around the world that are using mobile phones to do various different things. It could be financial, it could be social, it could be uh, a range of different things. And they are accessing products that are powered underneath the hood by DeFi and by by smart contract. And we see as that is the real growth that will happen over the course of years ahead. And Canvas, we're building the simple APIs and SDKs that will be uh, allowing the various participants to plug into this network and very quickly and easily uh, run various different products on our network. Sounds like a great vision. Um, Many listeners will be concerned. The past 12 months, we've seen um, Celsius fail with their lending platform. Genesis has just come out with big struggles. We had the Luna collapse. We had Three Arrows Capital collapsing. FTX just now went bankrupt with roughly $10 billion of user funds. Um, isn't this just a broken industry? Like, um, like why, why wouldn't people prefer to, to do all of these DeFi, all these financial uh, activities off of the blockchain you know wh- why do they want to why do they want to be doing this on, on this on this blockchain when this whole industry is just fa- failure after failure in the past 12 months i'd i'd be careful to paint the whole industry with with the you know sort of negativity of, of those different events like if we break that down a little bit more the celsius ftx um those types of businesses were just a failure of trust People were depositing assets in there that, you know, especially with FTX, where the the terms of service were saying that they wouldn't be lent out, or, or, or you know, sort of the the assets that I provided to FTX were my own, and and FTX chose to use that as their, you know, sort of funds to fund Alameda and, and other activities, which is a complete breach of the trust um, that I, as a customer, might have uh, 
you know, had in them to manage and hold my assets securely. And similarly with Celsius and, and some of the lending activities happening there. And unfortunately, that's then led to the contagion effects of Genesis and others that, um, you know, in this very fast moving industry with such a high degree of transparency, liquidations happen you know, incredibly quickly. And so even if someone might have been doing the right thing and, and you know, sort of doing loans that seem to be, um, uh, you know, with appropriate due diligence and, and counterparty checks, the situation can change so quickly that those loans suddenly become underwater and, and you can't liquidate the collateral quickly enough. So I think it all started with the loss of, of trust for, for FTX and, uh, and for Celsius. And then for Luna, I think, unfortunately, um, to putting aside the personalities involved in this situation, it was a poor design of of the actual mechanics of the way that Luna and, and UST worked. And, you know, if you would have looked in the early days of a project like Synthetics, there was very clear reason why when you're minting a, a collateralized stable coin, that you do that with more than, you know, just a one-to-one -one backing. You know, then when Synthetics first launched, it had, I think, a 700% collateralization. So seven times um, the value of SNX needed to then, you know, mint one synthetic USD stablecoin. And so when you take off the guardrails and try and, you know, sort of stimulate a protocol by by making it a lot easier to, you know, sort of YOLO your money in and, and you know, kind of get a great return. Um, these these things are going to happen. So I think we, we need to be really careful that as an industry, it's about educating um, users and, and retail and, and businesses to make sure that they know what they're getting into. And so, you know, as a result of all of these things, regulation is surely coming and it was already coming and now it's going to be coming even faster. And I think that that's really positive um, net for the industry because I think, you know, it will help to weed out the bad actors or those people that we shouldn't trust with our funds and we'll really get people to, to do their education before they um, put assets into any of these, uh, these services. I, th I think that the um, biggest uh, battle I've had in the past few months is uh, explaining to people outside of the blockchain industry that like the failure of FTX, the failure of Celsius, the failure of 3RS Capital was, was not a failure of like blockchain or digital assets. It was just a violation of trust the same way that you had it with Madoff, the same way that you had it with, well, mm. um, with tr tr the traditional system. If anything, all of these collapses um, just prove the value of having a transparent, permissionless, open system. And uh, for people outside of the industry, they don't really differentiate between the two worlds. They think Celsius is DeFi, but it's not. It's, it's traditional CeFi, really. No, That's and it's a... fraud. Let's call it for what it was. It's fraud. It's fraud and it's human nature and it's greed. And it's the same thing, like to your point, it's no different to Bernie Madoff. And the fundamental difference that when you have blockchain and when you have layer two like StarkX is that it's a clear cube of glass. It's crystal clear glass to see exactly what's within the platform. And there's no ability for the operator uh, to do anything with the user funds without their permission. And that's, a, that's fundamentally what happened with FTX. And like, think about when, if you're a pilot, how can you fly a plane safely if you can't trust your instruments to show you the correct altitude? If you're looking at your balance on a centralized exchange on a beautiful app, it doesn't matter how beautiful the app is, but if the numbers are just completely fake, that's how, how can you trust that? They, you can't. You're set up to fail. And that's what's happened here. It's a failure of centralized technology. And really what the promise, what it really shows now is that everything, and it validates what we've been, what we've believed since the beginning is that if you do as if you are self-custody, that you have your keys and you're working with a platform that gives you complete transparency about all of the assets that are held within the platform and that the operator can't do anything with those funds without your permission. And critically, if the operator decides to close, that you can still withdraw your funds so you're not reliant on them to remain, that the pretty website or the pretty app is still running that you can still at any point 
go to the contract on Ethereum and withdraw your funds. That's where we need to be. And that's how none of these exchanges, none of these recent failures had that ability. And that's a, the, the situation is horrific for everyone that lost. It's really bad. And it's put really unfortunate pollution on the entire industry. And it is, we've got a, to do a lot of work and education to come back from this. Like it, it's really easy for the entire industry to be tarred with this brush and to just say, no, nah, look, you had your chance, you blew it. And I think it, it, the, the silver lining is, and really the thing we have to look towards is saying, okay, we have to continue on and really these are the solutions that we can do to stop these things happening uh, in the future. And now you're seeing the start of it with the proof of reserves from the centralized exchanges, which is a good step, but it needs to really go the whole way of seeing a full picture of assets, liabilities, and just fundamentally having everything on chain and being transparent and having control over the funds, or at least knowing what the other side is able to do. I think it's this is time for decentralized finance to shine. You know, it has already looked through this whole last six months of from the minute Celsius collapsed through to 3OC and, and, you know, everything that's tumbled since DeFi, Aave, Uniswap, you know, all of these protocols have, have operated, you know, absolutely flawlessly. And so now it's it's really about, allowing people to utilize these really innovative and amazing technologies in a much more simple way to, to you know, simplify the on-ramps and to, to make it accessible to the next billion people. And so that's really what we're trying to achieve with Canvas is to bring that digital economy to that next wave of users. And, you know, they may not know that their loan that they're getting is powered by Aave under the hood, but that's the the promise that we see that DeFi can bring when you open that up to the masses. I have sold. I'm like, my head's hurting from nodding in agreement. Because <laughs> I think what, what we've done so well in, the, in the, this, this last segment is identify the problems with this with the centralized world that this blockchain world comes to solve. And I think people who are not blockchain native love to hear what problems the, the, the blockchain is coming to solve, what problems Canvas is coming to solve. And we just really summarize it so well in those past few minutes. Um, so just to conclude, where can people uh, keep up to date with what you're doing? Uh, where can they find you? Where can they learn more? Sure. Uh, you can check out our website, canvas.co. Uh, there's a content section on our website. You can follow us on socials, on Twitter, and on Medium. And uh, we're always happy to uh, for people to follow us and go along with us on the journey. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Dave and Tim, for your time. Uh, we'll include all those links in the show notes. And looking forward to you bringing the future of finance to billions of people. Thanks Take for care. your time. Thanks a lot, Laron. Bye. Thanks, Laron. Thank you.